Foundation and brought to you by Pacific News Center. My name is Jay Ariola and I'm your moderator. On behalf of our Bar Association, the 480 active lawyers who practice on the island of Guam, our president, Jacqueline Terlahi, and our board of governors, welcome to this presentation. We're glad to have with us our three Guam Bar members who are seeking office of the next elected Attorney General of Guam. And in ballot order, they are Gary Gumatauto, Doug Moylan, and Levin Camacho. We're going to have our opening statements by each of the candidates, uh, give you a brief background to get, uh, with them. Then they'll each have take turns answering the questions, most of which have been submitted by, uh, all of which have been submitted by Guam Bar members. Our first candidate, number one on the ballot, is Gary Rain Francis Gumatauto. Gary graduated with a JD from Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia, and he received his bachelor's degree from Old Dominion University in Norfolk. He served as previously as a deputy AG in the Civil Division and assistant deputy for the Solicitor's Division. He's been the chair of the business department at the Guam Community College. He is an experienced private practitioner and corporate counsel with more than 25 years experience in litigation, contracts, commercial transactions, real property, insurance and procurement. He is also a federally trained mediator. Gary has always been a legal advocate for our island's elderly, fighting for and defending them in all matters. He's known for his vigorous and aggressive work as a champion of the rights of those members in our society who need help, including the youth and Manamku. His achievements are numerous, including who's who in American law schools, as well as a member of the Phi Delta Kappa, Lambda Chi Alpha Sigma, Order of the Arrow, and Boy Scouts of America. He currently serves in the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary. He's number one on the ballot, and let's hear our opening statement from Gary Wayne Francis Gumatautau. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. Okay. It's on. Okay, here we go. Did you know that when mothers call into the child support division, they get this telephone purgatory, they can't reach a, a human being, it's always some kind of electronic... And I've tried that myself, and I can't get through. And it should be a system where that they call in, they get some kind of a, a live person right away. They get a name, they get a, a complaint number. They're told, they tell what they, they tell the person what they need, and then within 48 hours, they should be told the response that they're looking for. And if not, somebody in management needs to contact them back. And if not by then, then the AG himself or herself should be calling them back. This is not happening. It's not happening at all. Do you care? I care. Did you know that Guam has one of the highest enlistment rates for military across the country? And yet we provide no services at all, no legal services at all, for our veterans. We have a veterans office down in Inigua, but we don't staff it with an attorney. There are a lot of veterans today that are trying to proceed against the government for Agent Orange claims, also for their VA benefits, and they're not getting any help at all. And I think the AG's office needs to pitch in and help out. It's also with SECRA. And it's also with you, Sarah. These are things that, if you're a lawyer, you should know are protections for military. But we're not doing it. Nobody's doing it for them. They need to be done. As AG, I would do it. There's approximately $1 billion that's supposedly claimed by the government of Guam that's owed to us by the federal government for compact impact. But there's been absolutely no effort by the AG's office to try to collect it. There's been nothing at all. There's been no lawsuit filed at all. Nothing. As AG, I would do that. This is a time that people are having to decide whether they're going to buy groceries or gasoline. Because gasoline has jumped and everything else has jumped except wages. Wages are stagnant. Yet the AG's office just took an increase in its budget. I think it's immoral for a government agency to take an increase in its budget when everybody else is tightening their belts. When the people of Guam have got to decide between groceries and gas, this agency is taking, taking more than $17 million and over 223 employees. First thing I'm going to do when I get in, if I get elected, is cut that budget by 10%. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Our candidate number two on the ballot is Douglas Brian Keola Moylan. Doug graduated from Father Duaneus High School, as well as the University of Notre Dame, 
and Santa Clara University School of Law. He's been admitted to practice in Guam, California, and Washington, D.C., and he's been in private practice for about 28 years now, in general criminal and civil case practitioner. He has served as a law clerk for Superior Court Judge La Morena, as staff attorney at the Superior Court, as legislative counsel to the 24th, 25th, and 26th Guam legislatures. He was a member of the Guam Election Commission and was the first elected Attorney General of Guam back in 2003. He currently is a sole practitioner with the law offices of Doug Moylan. Douglas B. Moylan, ladies and gentlemen, is candidate number two. Papa Day and come a stop. My name's Doug Moylan. I think that those of you who remember the controversial years back in 2003 to 2006, remember that that was the first office that required the enactment of many legislations in order to define what the office is. We're now 12 years later, three attorney generals since I served, and I believe the terrain is ready to really put that office into gear. As a practitioner for over 28 years, I actually worked in all three branches of government, as Jay had pointed out. I believe that I have the most to offer you as voters and can do the best job. I respect Gary, I respect uh, Levin, but of the three of us, because of my track record as an attorney general, you don't need to relearn the, the uh, wheel. I know what it takes to be an attorney general. I know that communication with the other two branches will be critical for the next four years. And I believe that with my experience, I can bring the most to the people of Guam and the voters. Experience matters. Age and experience equals wisdom. I think those of us who are old enough know that you can make mistakes, you do make mistakes when you're younger, but as you get older, you learn more and you know when to act, when to keep silent, and how to act. I offer a new and better era to have the Attorney General actually work to help each one of you. What I've learned in the first four years was that the Attorney General has to focus more on what makes your lives better. Somewhat like a politician, but we're the guys that have to go into court and fight things out. It's not a kiss your, uh, the babies, shake people's hand type position. You're controversial, you're an attorney, and what is the type of attorney that you want? You want the pit bull. You want the guy that's not gonna turn over when he goes before that court hearing. You want the guy that's gonna appeal it up to the US Supreme Court, and that's what I did. We started in 2003, we ended in 2006, and that case won in 2007. We showed the governor that you have to follow the law. It wasn't out of pride, but it was out of principle. And that's the same principle where I think the Attorney General in the next four years will help bring what that office was intended to, to be. I see Congressman Underwood there. He was the enactor of the elected Attorney General's Act to put that into the Organic Act and give us the same footing as the governor. If elected, I have five items that are on my priority list. The first one is increasing child support collections. As Gary pointed out, I'm the one that switched that office and made all those investigators contact every child support recipient and require the child support recipients get a survey that if you are not getting your case heard, that I will be notified. It went right to me. I'm also the one that increased the child support with Bobby Cepeda, who was the, the child support uh, deputy in charge. Child support was higher than it ever was collected in the past. If elected, I intend to bring back the delinquency list and the non-locatables list that will be published. But it's not just a, a mean list that you put out that you're not paying your child support. Back then, and what I intend to do again, is give those people the opportunity to make amends with the courts and make sure they're back on track and paying those supports. Because if they don't pay support, you pay support through your welfare and your taxes. Women that should get that support, men that should get that support, that are custodial parents, don't have to and should not be going to the government to get that support. Deport criminals. Some of you may say, well, that's, that's un-American, it's non-hospitable, it's inconsistent with our island way of life. No, to be a US citizen is a privilege. Anyone who enters our island, even though the federal government has opened it up, is here as a privilege. You violate that privilege, you are not a US citizen, your rights are very limited, we send you back. As an attorney general, I will work with the governor and the Department of Homeland Security to send those people back. 
the, those that offend the law should not be among us. Our children should have that opportunity to be all that they can be. Prosecute corrupt officials. I don't have to say more than that. Four years, we prosecuted as many government corruption cases as we could. We came down with 26 convictions. We went to trial four times. Before your juries, we won three of the four. And the AG should be able to prosecute cases. My history is I've tried in my 28 years criminal and civil cases. I've been before the Federal District Court, the Superior Court of Guam, the Guam Supreme Court. I've argued before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and we ended up with the U.S. Supreme Court victory. It's not easy to get before the U.S. Supreme Court, but they saw our cause as a just one, and they ruled in our favor. In your favor, the people of Guam. <coughs> Prosecute sex crimes against women and children. We're having too many sex crimes hit the, the books, hit the court system. We have to do more. And finally, promote sustainable military buildup. Anything the AG's office can do to increase the facilitation of our military, the better. The only two forms of economy that I've seen in my lifetime has been tourism and military. With Korea, China, China's building those, uh, those islands and the reefs and so forth, Guam is and has always been the most important U.S. soil. We are a carrier. You cannot launch bombers from aircraft carriers. They need Guam. And at the end, I will give you a few more uh, initiatives that we will be uh, presenting if elected as Attorney General. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. <clears throat> Number three on our ballot is Levin Taitino Camacho. Levin is a proud uh, graduate of the Guam public school system, having attended and graduated from John F. Kennedy High School. He attended the University of Washington, and after graduating from there, he attended, graduated from the Boston University School of Law. He clerked for the Supreme Court of Guam before entering in private practice. He has been a private practitioner practitioner for the past 12 years, seven years as a solo practitioner. He's handled more than 100 criminal cases and over 15 Supreme Court of Guam appeals. He has assisted the governments of Guam and the CNMI in reviewing complex environmental impact studies. He's also litigated several land rights and environmental justice cases, including a lawsuit to stop the construction of the firing range complex over Pogget Village and the case challenging the proposed development of a high-rise tower in southern Guam. He is also local counsel in the national lawsuit seeking to extend voting rights to U.S. citizens living in the territories. Ladies and gentlemen, Levin Taitino Camacho. Half a day. Uh, the first thing, Nana, if you're watching, I'm sorry I didn't shave. I cut my face. This is why I have a ridiculous bandage on, and I didn't want to have a random patch of hair and the rest of my face was clean shaven. So, half a day. As Jay mentioned, my name is Levin Taitano Camacho, and I'm the third candidate on the ballot. I want to talk to you today about motive. Okay? Motive is one of those things that we hear about in law, but I think most people understand. Why do people do things? Right? So when you hear about a crime, a crime of passion, they were acting because they were egu. They were acting because they were greedy. Right? And one of the most common questions that I've been asked is, what would possess you to run for the office of the Attorney General? And this is the truth. I see day to day how important the services are provided by the Office of the Attorney General, whether you're a victim of crime, whether you're receiving child support, whether you're a private contractor and you're having to deal with agencies. And I know that I can do a good job if I was elected. And it's not clever, and it's not a bullet point list, but that's the truth. And this is where I think being genuine is much more important than trying to be clever or trying to be witty. Now, why do I want to run for Attorney General? Because there are lots of people who want to do good things for Guam. And the reality is, with the budget that was just passed by the legislature, the next elected Attorney General will learn to do less with, will, will need to do more with less, okay? It was passed, it still hasn't been approved by the governor. $14.7 million was appropriated. That's 1.5 million less than what was appropriated last year. $1.5 million, whoever is elected will have to go into that office and try to implement some of the things that we're talking about today. I could give you a wish list of all the things that I would do if I was elected, but again, the reality is $1.5 million less. How do we improve the services to the people of Guam working within that budget? That's the challenge. So the two things I will focus on are accountability and efficiency. Okay. Accountability, first you start with external accountability. Who, do the, who does the Office of the Attorney General represent? 
the people of Guam and the government of Guam. So external accountability, we need to look at the agencies and see what can we do so they're providing services more efficiently, better, and I'm looking at the developments of standard operating procedures, training materials. There are certain things like the open government law where every agency needs to follow it. We need to make sure that any board member who takes a seat understands the basic knowledge of how that works. Sunshine law, we've seen numerous lawsuits or requests filed. What training do we have or can we provide to the agencies and to the directors to make sure they understand what those laws are? Okay. If we can do that and take some of the work away from the AG's office and give it back to the agencies to resolve a question that may go beyond what's uh, required for disclosure under the, under the Sunshine Law, that's a win. And now an attorney can focus on doing the work that is going to impact the people of Guam. All right? Internal accountability, I'm talking about goal setting. All right? I'm talking about SLPs internally. We know um, that when someone comes in as a new prosecutor, what tools do we give them to succeed? What resources do we give them to succeed? What goals are we setting within that agency? Child support, we've talked about child support. You know, that $5, $5 million didn't come out of nowhere. The OPA has done reports 2003 and 2006, and in that period of time, it increased by $1 million. Okay? That's in 2006, it was at $6.5 million. It's come down, I think, to around $5 million. We need to do more to get that money back to the parents who pay that. All right? But what has the Office of the Attorney General said? They need to hire someone to do it. They need to have an independent financial person go in and figure out how do we know where this money is and how do we give it back to the rightful people. Okay? Again, where do we find the resources? But those are the kinds of things that you need to look at developing procedures in. Right? And efficiency. I'm a big fan of technology. And I think technology is a way that we can achieve better communication with the community. Because the biggest complaint against attorneys is that they don't communicate with their clients. You could be doing a great job, but if your client doesn't know that, they can be upset with you. So how can we use technology? Uh, Attorney Gumutata mentioned child support. What can we use technology to, get, to let clients know about what's going on with their cases? What can we do for victims of crime to let them know what the processes are going to be? So again, what can we do within the budget, within, within that $14.7 million, to improve the relationship with the people of Guam, with the government of Guam, and still carry out these essential functions? And that's what I offer. Thank you. Thank you, Leland. We're going to take a pause right now for a commercial break. Candidate number two, Doug Moylan. Doug, do you believe that deportation and other immigration consequences should be considered in the criminal cases pursued by the Office of the Attorney General? If yes, in what types of cases? I do believe that it needs to be considered because the quality of everybody's lives are affected by the number of people that are on this limited economy that we are in. Those people that are not U.S. citizens should not have the privilege of violating our laws, hurting our people, and remaining in our community. Like in the states, whether you're Democrat, Republican, it hurts just to have these type of people. The type of cases should be limited to the criminal cases, um, and it should be done with the, in conjunction with the Attorney General, our ability to do plea agreements, and the defendant's willingness to just leave without being punished uh, as they otherwise would be or be punished for a certain amount of time, the Governor and Department of Homeland Security. Homeland Security is the only one with the President um, that has the ability to actually prevent the, to actually order the deportation. We would do it by plea agreement, um, and I believe the governor has been doing that currently, but I, I have the ability to, um, uh, would recommend an ability to put it in the plea agreements, make it a policy of the office. Thank you. I'm, I'm not in favor of deportation in any case. However, I mean, in my mind, the idea is you're going to let somebody have a buy just because they're not from Guam? and they committed a crime here, we're going to let them go, and they go free just because they go back home? I don't think that's right. I think they need to serve their time before they go. But my whole idea about the prison system is that I think we're giving people a way out by just going to prison, and they sit around all day doing nothing over there. For the most part, some of them are going back to school. Some of them are trying to better themselves. But I really think we need to put them on hard labor. What I'd really like to see is a prison system where it's a farm, and they're working, and they're working day and night. So you've got two shifts, and you've got one shift, that's working, one shift that's in the bed. So we don't need a new prison. And let's get them out there working on our streets, working in public places to clean up, doing repairs and things that we're spending money on that we don't need to spend. So I don't really want to see people get out of here unless they're the absolute worst offenders, then let them out of here and don't let them come back. Uh, I, I support the deportation of violent criminals and criminal sexual conduct, but I do not support the commutation of those sentences just so that they can be deported. Uh, and what I mean by that is what's been happening lately is that you get a sentence for a crime, 
the governor may commute the sentence. Basically, you don't have to do any more time and then send you. I do believe that if you've committed a crime, you need to, to pay the penalty. So looking at what the compact ways that to ensure they're going to be incarcerated if we do deport those individuals. With drug offenses, this is really the trickiest case because the legislature has created this program. The judiciary does this great program, the adult drug court program, which allows for dismissal and expungement. Controlled substance is a deportable offense under federal law. So you have individuals, and I, I heard of a case where someone went, you're, you're tested three times, it's very, a very challenging program, and this person who's an FSM citizen completed the program, successfully did, had the case dismissed and expunged, but was still deported. And that person had a family here, they were working, all right? I think those are the kinds of cases where I wouldn't support deportation because guess what happens, okay? You take away the, the income earner for this family, you separate them from their spouse and from their children, and you create more problems for Guam and you create more problems for the family. So I think we do need to look at immigration in a much bigger perspective, um, but I, I, don't, I do support it in certain instances. Thank you. One minute question, beginning with Levin. What specific qualifications do you bring with you to enable you to perform the duties and responsibilities of the Attorney General of Guam? You know, th this is really one of those questions where I have fought for the people of Guam, all right? And not in my professional capacity, or I've used my degree, but I've done it through pro bono work. Okay? So I'm talking specifically about our lawsuits against the federal government when they failed to comply with NEPA, when they failed to comply with the National Historic Preservation Act. Right? So someone who, when we get paid to represent a client, that's your job. Okay? The way that I look at leaders, what do you do on your spare time? What do you do with your life? All right? And those people who are committed to serving the people of Guam after they've worked from eight to five, balancing that with their family lives, those are the people that you want in office. Okay? So I may not have 25 or 30 years of experience, but there's a big difference between experience and leadership. So what I bring to the table, if I am elected the, off, the attorney general, is a perspective on leadership and empowering the employees, not just firing everybody. You know? People like to do their jobs. They care about the people of Guam. They want to do their jobs well. How do we empower those people, get their buy-in to work for you and to work for the people of Guam? How do we get them excited about it? So I have, again, um, I'm very interested in efficiency, technology, but that's the approach that I bring if I am elected the Attorney General. Thanks. Part of the Attorney General's job is public service. So looking at the candidate's history of public service, I believe, is one of the most important things you have to look at. I was, first of all, I went to law school on your tax dollar. At UOG, I was availed to the Professional Technical Award and went to law school for three years, uh, in part because of the, uh, the uh, territory of Guam and the trust that uh, the UOG had in me. The um, first thing that I started doing was working for the government of Guam. I was the staff attorney, um, law clerk for the presiding judge, um, uh, Senator Speaker uh, B.J. Cruz, I, I clerked for him. I was a uh, small claims referee for several years. Uh, I see Senator Lulian Guerrero here. She was uh, instrumental in my being part of the Legislative Council for three years, the 24th, 25th, 26th Guam Legislature, which I submit to you is a public service. Anyone that's in that legislature is there for public service because you don't spend that many hours doing what those people do and get paid uh, a fair wage. After that, I also served on the Guam Election Commission for. I can't even count how many elections, maybe for six years, three different terms. Um, and it culminated with that service to you as the Attorney General. The first elected office, I was fortunate enough to be trusted with that position. I would submit to you respectfully as voters that of the three candidates, uh, my background, my training, my experience will help me best serve you as the uh, uh, voters the people that will benefit or, or be, be hurt by an attorney general in their performance of their duties. You have a four-year track, track record from us. And again, I just give the culmination. We won before the U.S. Supreme Court. Among lawyers, enough said. Among you, it helped you because it told the government officials, stop borrowing because you're going to destroy yourselves like Puerto Rico is. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. Actually, this is my 30th year of practicing law. So when you, your introduction was 25, I think that came off my website. It's old. So uh, 30 years of practicing law. I ran out of an equipment company for 13 years. Out of an equipment company, I made a lot of money working for them, so I'm not in this game for money anymore. Uh, I was a manager for Hilton and Holiday Inn. I worked for Hilton and Holiday Inn Corporate before I came back out to Guam. I came to Guam in 1981 
and I walked across the picket line. So some of you might be old enough to remember the, the teacher strike. And I walked right across the picket line to go to work at Guam Community College. And it was shortly after that that the, that, that the entire labor issue resolved itself. And it was the 32 teachers that I worked for that voted me in as chairman for four years, even though I had walked across the line against their principles. And it says a lot, I think, over the kind of person I've become. Because I learned, I learned a lot about how people are, and I learned how to serve people. I learned that to be a manager, a good manager, you need to find out what makes your people tick. And you need to be the one to provide them with the tools and the way to get the job done. I've served on various boards. I've served on boards for tour companies on Guam. I started a radio station in Guam. I started a limousine service in Guam. I'm basically a businessman and a lawyer. I've also been the school board's lawyer several times. That hasn't always turned out nice, but I've done it. And that's the biggest agency of the government of Guam. So I've got the experience that it takes to administer an agency. I can handle a $17 million agency. I don't equipment company was a lot more than that. There's no problem. I can get the job done. So I think I'm qualified to get it done. But more importantly, I've got the love. I've got the love that it takes to get the job done. I'm Chamorro. I'm actually Chamalinian. So my blood not only is from Guam, but from the outer islands as well as well as a lot of other Chamorros that are out here that don't want to admit it. My daughter's Filipina, so we cross all of the boundaries here in Guam. So I'll take care of all the people of Guam because my heart's in it. Let's take a one minute break. Thank you and welcome back. Going to our next question, beginning with uh, candidate number two, Doug Moylan. In 2013, the total number of criminal, felony, and misdemeanor prosecutions was 1,793 cases. In 2017, it was 1,497. How would you prioritize criminal prosecutions? What do you have to say about the increasing crime rate, yet the corresponding decrease in the number of criminal cases over the past four years? Part of the increase in crime has been because of the immigrant community. Anyone that practices in the spirit court knows that the criminal calendar, the family court calendar, are predominantly immigrants. They are the ones that are tapping our judicial resources. If elected, I'm in, this, in the initial stages of developing what I call the DRIP program, which is basically dispute resolution initiative plan, which is basically to look at every case that comes to the AG's office and see if we can avoid having to file it. Talking to the lawyers, seeing if there's a plea agreement that can be effectuated before actually going forward. The priority has, has always been and shall always be, in my mind, the, criminal protection, the, the prosecution of criminal cases, the protection of the community. On your Maslow's hierarchy of needs, to ensure that our community is safe uh, against violent crimes, against nonviolent crimes, will always take priority. So, the fact that our AG's office is reducing the, the output, um, it concerns me. Comments were made earlier. When I was the Attorney General, we had a seven, about a $7 million budget. I always came in below budget because I tapped our federal funds, I looked at the attorneys, I allocated the resources according to the priorities of the office. The AG's office now has a budget of $16 million, although cut recently with the budget law down to, I think, 13 or $14 million. They have 50 more employees than when I was there. We had 120 total employees, attorneys and staff. They now have 170. So the last three AGs that have been in office have hired 50 more people, but what have you seen come out of that office that is any different than in 2003 to 2006 when myself and my team, including Gary, who I hired in the civil division, served you. You've seen a regression because more money is thrown at the problem, less output, because the attorney generals haven't prioritized their, their agendas. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Uh, you know, I, I think conviction rates and prosecution numbers are very important, but I think the more important number to look at is recidivism, right? How many of these people have committed crimes and are being charged again later on, okay? Because if the, if the number of cases coming down is because someone who's committed a crime and, and gotten treatment, now was no longer committing a crime, I wouldn't say that's necessarily bad for the community. Uh, I think the biggest trouble facing Guam right now are drugs. And we have a lot of cases involving ICE, 
particularly. We have the drug court program that assists people um, to help them get that addiction under control. But the, what I see as a gap is we don't have that same type of treatment for property crimes. Right? So if someone breaks into a house to get money for drugs, they, don't, they aren't eligible for drug court. Right? So what happens? They go to jail, three years, five years, they get out. You haven't fixed the problem. They still have a drug problem when they get out of jail. So if I'm elected attorney general, what I would look at, again, conviction rates are great. You want to be able to request the budget. But I'm more important is making sure people are safe. Right? That is the most important. Do we feel safer today than we did in 2003 or 2010? And the answer to that is no. And again, I, I would say because drugs are a big problem and you're worried about your getting your car broken into or your house getting broken into. Thank you. I have to agree with Levin with regard to the, the scourge on Guam and it's ICE. It was without a doubt it's ICE. I was married to somebody that was an ICE addict. And I know it's hell. This is absolute hell. And you've got to take care of the problem as a health issue. If you don't deal with it as a health issue, the system will just keep going around and around and around in a circle. It's very expensive, but it's very expensive in ways more than money can count. So you've got to deal with that. And I know the court is already dealing with with, it, with a drug court, but I'm not so sure that that's enough. And I had one lawyer come up to me who was a very prominent uh, criminal defense attorney, and he says, what we should do in Guam is just do away with drug laws. And he had a very compelling argument for that. But that's not up to the AG to do. Okay, I'm not here to nullify the law. I'm here to enforce the law, okay, to do justice. Okay, so I would say that the legislature needs to look at that problem. But as far as the, the crime rate and dealing with the the prosecution rate in the office, that one of the first things I want to do is take a look at whether or not we really are charging out all the crimes that, that come to our attention. Because I hear a lot of complaints from business people that they report crimes and they're not being, they're not being addressed. There's a lot of white-collar crime out there that's not being addressed. And we know for sure there's a lot of corruption with the government that's not being addressed. So I don't think that the numbers that we're seeing r really reflect the amount of, of problem that we've got with regard to crime. Lastly, you know, I think that every plea agreement that comes before the Attorney General needs to be addressed in terms of what is the prosecutorial advantage to the people of Guam by taking this plea. I know that there's one judge in particular that used to ask that question every time that somebody would bring a plea agreement to her, and I think she got tired of it. But we really need to look at that, and we need to decide whether or not, as a matter of policy, are we just pumping out plea agreements, or are we really doing justice? That's what we need to do is take a look at that and develop a policy that really addresses that. Thank you. One minute question going to leave in first. One of our senators last week called on the Attorney General to report on the status of the investigation of Lieutenant Governor Ray Tenorio, claiming that this investigation casts a cloud over upcoming elections. If you were the Attorney General, how would you respond? Well, no one is above the law, and everyone wants to have faith that the system is going to work, no matter if it's you or me who's charged with a crime or committed a crime or is under investigation. But I think the Office of the Attorney General Barry Anderson is doing the right thing. As prosecutors, you can't comment on cases that are ongoing or under investigation. I know that the people uh, want to know what the status is, and the, the Attorney General can make those types of remarks. But in terms of where, what's going to happen, it has to be sequential. Okay? And ethically, that's the way it should happen because everyone is entitled to a fair trial. We may not agree with it, but that's the way the system is designed. You don't want someone being tried because of a news story that's run or because of inflammatory statements or anonymous trolls on the Internet. That's not the way that the, the, the criminal justice system works. So I think Attorney General Barrett Anderson should give an update on the status of the investigation, but I would also understand if she, it's just it's under investigation. That's a perfectly um, ethically responsible answer to give. Thank you. I think everybody that's, that's met me already knows my position on this. Grab a gun, go to jail. And I mean it. Okay, this is not a game. We're talking about felonies here. We're talking about people that could be hurt. Three times he grabbed that gun. And three times he waved it around. And three times the officer chased him down to get the gun. The gun was loaded. How do we know this? You know, Ray was on television talking about it. He gave the information to the reporter. He admitted it. Now, I love Ray. I know Ray personally. I was very close to his mother. I really do like Ray. I just saw him on Saturday. And it would pain me to have to be the one to prosecute him for this. That's why I would hope that the current AG would do the job. <laughs> but if not, I will do my job, and I will do justice. So my job is to put him in the system. If 
a grand jury comes back with a true bill, then I will charge it out, and I will prosecute under the law and do justice. Thank you. When I was the attorney general, that was a common uh, occurrence that occurred. You had a high-profile person get a call at 1 o'clock in the morning saying that there's a family violence case going on between these people, and I made sure that the police officers called me directly. I didn't leave it to a chief prosecutor or another attorney. And I would have to make the decision on first whether there's going to be a book and release, book and confinement, um, and obviously whether or not there was probable cause to begin with um, for that, that matter. With the current lieutenant governor, there's various issues that, that are involved here. Every attorney general on Guam is a law enforcement officer. The investigators are law enforcement officers. They're allowed to carry weapons. The governor has the authority to faithfully execute the laws of Guam under the Organic Act. There's a question about whether or not the lieutenant governor was given that authority. And you heard the governor come out and say it. I gave him the authority to oversee it. I do not believe that it is responsible to say anything about what's going on until you're sitting in the chair like our chief prosecutor is there. And I would, uh, two issues at stake. One, you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. Even up till the time that that jury goes out and deliberates, Ray is innocent until proven guilty. And I would disagree with Levin. There's no ethical rule that outright prohibits the prosecutor from talking. There are rules, but not one that says you can't talk about a case. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Along the same lines, going over to Gary, there have been several publicized cases of public corruption or wrongdoing by agency officials, such as the Gura case, more recently, Chamorro Land Trust Commission has come under fire. Do you believe that the Office of the Attorney General should play a more proactive role in such cases? If yes, what kind of role would that be? One minute, please. Well, I don't think the AG should wait until the police department decides they want to send the report over when it's on the front page of the news and everybody else is talking about it. They need to say, where's the report? Where's the investigation? And they have their own team of investigators as well. And they're all... They're all educated, they're all experienced, they know what they're doing with this, so they should get involved and get their job done. So I don't think that it's up to the AG to just wait for the report to come. Sometimes the AG's got to reach out and make that happen. And then once that they get the information, they've got to decide what to do with it. Now we know that CL Shamor Land Trust has been in the paper. GDOE's been in the paper. GPD's been in the paper. The governor's office has been in the paper. People are tired of the corruption. And they want something done about it. So that's our job as the AG. Do it. If you can't do it, then don't bother to go for the job. Corruption should be prosecuted. Uh, but I also think that the AG should play a role in preventing corruption to begin with. You know, training. Uh, with the Tremoral Land Trust, it just it goes to show that people don't know what they're doing. And if the Office of the Attorney General can go in there and tell people, this is the way, these are what your responsibilities are first, maybe we avoid the Im improprieties that happen over decades of time at the Tremoral Land Trust. And I do want to make a comment. I mean, Attorney McDonald probably knows the specific rule under the prosecutor's ethics that you cannot trial publicity. It's black and white. You can't make anything. There are very specific things you can comment on, but you can't try to inflame the community and deprive someone of their right to a fair trial. Thank you, Jay. When I ran in 2002, public corruption was the top priority. When I came in, we created the Government Corruption Division, separate and apart from the general crimes. And we actually called it the, uh, the Government Corruption Division and the General Crimes Division. We separated it. Government corruption is white collar. Usually the accountants, like the FBI, mainly uh, accountant, uh, uh, what is it? accountant lawyers is what the FBI is primarily made of. They're structured to go after white collar type crimes. Guam has, every community has white collar crime. Every community has a certain amount of percentage. But as Fred Canover said, back in 2003, our percentage was greater than most communities. And I prioritized it. If elected, you're going to see that thing right back in. We're going to go after everybody that has committed a crime, the certifying officers, and I put a warning right now. Certifying officers, if they misspend that money appropriated by our good senators, like Teresa Lahi here, we're going to go after them. The retirement fund, you're going to be gone after. The government corruption division is coming back. But we have other priorities as well. Thank you. Continuing on with the uh, topic that all of you have already brought up, child support. 
Child Support Enforcement Division has one of the most important responsibilities to ensure that parents and children receive their child support. What's the biggest problem facing that division? And how would you improve the collection and distribution of child support? Beginning with Doug. Child support affects every family, every person on Guam in some way. When I came into office, we increased the numbers with Bobby Cepeda, as I mentioned, and we created it not, you're going to have to pay, you're going to have to pay. We initiated the Love Your Kids program. If I come back, that's coming back too. We're also going to find out where Eric went, Eric the Eagle. We did the, and I'll, I'll have to ask uh, Ms. Uh, General Limtiaco where that, that bird went. That bird, that Eric the Eagle symbol, was intended to, to take the animosity out of a very caustic uh, type of relationship that most people are aware of. When, when men are having to pay child support, which is the majority of our community, the majority gender, it's very painful because they're not only lost the mother of the, the child, but they have all these other issues going on. We promoted the custodial parent rule to try to encourage a father's participation. We increased the child support. And how we did it, I went after those investigators in the child support division, those ones that weren't returning calls. We had a performance standard, and that's going to come back. And the survey, by the way, that's what got me involved in knowing which investigators weren't doing their work and which attorneys needed to do more. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you, attitude is one of the biggest problems they've got. If you look at the website and it goes in there in the frequently asked questions, there's a section that talks about if you're not satisfied with the services here, you know what you're supposed to do? Hire a lawyer. They tell people to hire a lawyer. Well, what's the government supposed to be doing with Child Support Enforcement Division? Okay, that's their job. Don't tell people to go hire a lawyer. That's what your job is at the AG's office. I'll tell you the biggest problem over there, though, with that is antiquated system. They need a new computerized system and software. They don't have it. It's going to cost a lot of money. But once they get it, they can just zip it out. This is part of what Levin's talking about with technology. We do need it in that department. I think once we've got that and we get the people trained and get the morale back up to where it ought to be, we can get the job done, number one. Thanks, Gary. It's important for any parent who's relying on those funds to get them for food, for school supplies. School starts this week. I'm sure if there are parents who are waiting. I believe that the law requires you to get it with, to the, the or it was before it was non-custodial custodial, but now with, even with the joint physical custody, you can still pay child support. So the parent who's receiving child support should get those funds within two days of the Office of the Attorney General getting it. You know, we need to develop standards, all right? But we also need to take care of the elephant in the room, which are these undistributed funds. And again, 3.7 million of that $5 million has been sitting for decades, okay? For more than five years. The next Attorney General needs to figure out how we can get that money back to the people who it belongs to, and if not, what steps need to be taken to, to handle that money, all right? So my priority would be following the recommendations of this current Attorney General to get the help to figure out who those funds belong to. Let's get that out because that's 73% of those undistributed funds. We don't know what to do with them. All right, so efficiency and communication. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, David. Let's take a break now. Take about a one minute break. Thank you, and going back to our next round of questions for a one minute answer. Starting with Levin, what powers of the Attorney General would you recommend to the legislature to change, clarify, or improve? Wow, okay. That's a... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right now there, there is, well, I don't know if this is coming up in the future, there's a bill, but in terms of clarifying what responsibilities the biggest issue I, I can say right now would be funding. <laughs> How do you expect the Office of the Attorney General to perform these services with the budget that's been allocated, right? So we talked about child support, updating those systems. We know what the problems are, but when are we going to get the money to update these systems to improve technology? One of the biggest issues in criminal prosecution is licensing. You know, if you've ever had Microsoft Word, you have a personal license they have for the uh, law enforcement. We can't afford the licenses so that all of our prosecutors have access to the system. That's a problem. It's not a people problem, it's not an intelligence problem, it's a money problem. But we need to look at ways that we can use technology. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are lots of other jurisdictions that we can look at for cost-effective ways to improve things. But again, where are we going to find the money? Where are we going to find the people? Those are the two most important things you're going to need to run that office. Thank you. 
Elizabeth Barrett Anderson was an appointed attorney general. This bill, 317-34, that was, uh, I believe, introduced by Senator St. Augustine, is a culmination of the attorney general's powers and duties throughout the United States. Guam took its statute as the AG being the chief legal officer from Illinois. The Supreme Court, when I was the attorney general, ruled in the airport versus Moylan that the AG had all the common law powers, but they didn't enumerate all of them. And they also said, most importantly, that all those common law powers are subject to the legislature's uh, crafting, limitation, expanding, okay? So in her bill, the four most important uh, powers that, and she, she put everything together. This is the wish list for an attorney general. So we don't have to go fight for years on whether or not the AG has the power to do this or that. The first, uh, overall, there's three main goals of the attorney general. One, protect the public interest. Two, provide uniform legal, uh, legal authority throughout the, legal um, decisions, uniformity of legal opinions throughout the entire government of Guam. And number three, reduce the cost of attorneys. The four uh, parts of this bill affect every provision that I just mentioned. It gives the Attorney General more authority to represent the entire government of Guam. It stops the autonomous agencies from hiring these million dollar councils. Literally, Senator Cruz, he did the Sunshine Act many times. Four or five million dollars for one law firm compared to our law firm back then was around a whole year, 120 people with seven million dollars. Thank you. Well, I take umbrage to something that my colleague said, and that was that, you know, we can do more with less, because the logical conclusion of doing more with less is you can do a lot with nothing, and that doesn't happen. That's been an old mantra of the federal government. They finally got tired of it, and they said it doesn't work. Okay, being with the Coast Guard as long as I have, you know, I've already learned that it doesn't work that way. You do the best with what you've got, and at some point, you can't do any more with it. And I don't expect these people to break their backs working for the, working for the Attorney General's office to try to come up with, with things that can't be done because there's only 40 hours in a week. Already he's talking about he's going to have to ask for more money. Well, that's not going to be one of the things I'm looking for. I'm looking to try to get the job done within the amount of money that we're given, you know, and slice off as much as we can. If everybody else in Guam was having to tighten their belt, we're going to tighten our belt too. I think the wish list that the AG has already given to Senator St. Augustine works. My only problem with it is that I think that one part of it is, in, is inorganic. I think that it's very difficult for us to, to think that we're going to be able to get away with taking power away from the governor and the governor not suing us. Thank you. Thank you. With all our little breaks, we've exceeded our time limit, and so we're going to go right to the closing statements. Each of you has about a minute to give your pitch, um, and we'll begin with Levin. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I'd like to thank my wife for being here today. She really is the only reason why I've been able to run this, for this election, this position. My mom is here, and she's present, and uh, I'm just grateful to have them both in my life. My dad as well, who's in Hawaii, maybe watching right now. Um, details matter, okay? I can stand up here and tell you, again, this is what we need to fix this, this is what we need to fix that, but the details matter, all right? Leadership matters, okay? A leader with experience is a great leader, but having lots of experience doesn't make you a great leader. Okay. So what I offer is an attention to detail, a work ethic, and a willingness to fight for the people of Guam, and I've demonstrated that through my record. All right? I will rest on my record. I don't need to stand up here and give you rhetoric. Look at what I've done for the people of Guam with the great help of people like Lasia, who's here, the Guam Preservation Trust, We Are Guahan, people who care about this community, and they need someone who's like them, who's willing to stand up, not to collect a paycheck, because they know that they have families here, that this is their home, and they want to make sure that their kids want to come back and, and live here and, and create a, a better life for everybody. So leadership, efficiency, and accountability, those are the three things that I offer, and I'm number three on the ballot, Levin Taitano Camacho. Thank you. Thank you, Levin. First 100-day initiatives. One, prosecute those not paying retirement funds. Assign prosecutors to prosecute tax crimes for non-payment of civil and criminally uh, tax cases. Three, assign attorneys to work at DRT to bring in more money for the uh, Guam coffers. Four, prosecute, if warranted, the land trust investigation, cigarette tax evasion, government office pay raises, Tumon gun incident. Five, put to use the six million in child support funds. First, find out whose money it is. Second, 
If we can't find it out, ask it to the government of Guam so the legislature can pass a law that allows that money to be put into a trust managed by Gita so that we can take the money where the AG and the governor possibly decide what benefit the children can have from that. Use that money as a corpus as opposed to it sitting in the bank. And by the way, prosecute anyone that has touched that money, including the governor. That money, according to reports earlier, was tapped into by the department administration. It wasn't the government's money. It was the children's money. Get the government to go after, get the AG's office to go after the federal government to pay the receivership. Go after that money that we've had to pay over these past few years. Eliminate waste and efficiency in the AG's office. You trusted me in the past to be your Attorney General. I humbly request for your trust in me again. I can do the job. I have other opportunities, but at this time in my life, I'm 51 years old, and I believe that I can better serve our community, my children, or all of our children, if I was to be given that opportunity to be in the AG's office once again. I did what I said I was going to do. I'll continue doing what I say I'm going to do. I made promises, and I don't think there's anyone that can say I didn't do what I promised back in 2002. Bring back law and order and respect for our community. Thank you. Sizuus Masi and Raman Salamat Po. Thank you, Doug. Well, you've heard it from all of us, and all three of us, I think, have uh, shown the community that we're good lawyers and we're concerned about trying to serve our community. And I think what distinguishes me from the others is I've got a lot of experience. At 30 years as an attorney, I've, given, I've served in the military. You know, I've also given a lot of time. My work with the Coast Guard is 100% voluntary because I'm with the auxiliary. Okay, the work I do with the Boy Scouts, the work I've done with March of Dimes in the mainland, with the Red Cross, things like that, that's all community service. And every time that I meet with somebody that's poor or somebody that's a senior citizen that can't take care of themselves, I give pro bono work. I don't keep track of that. I'm not putting signs up to tell people, oh, look at Frank Kumatata, he's doing this for the public. I do it because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for my community. And I want to do that as the Attorney General. I want to be your Attorney General, and I want to serve all the people of Guam, no matter where they're from. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the members of the Guam Bar Association, once again, thank you very much. Thank you to Pacific News Center for broadcasting this live on Facebook and streaming it live. They will be rebroadcasting this prior to the election. Uh, as a public service, the Guam Bar Association is pleased to present this event to you. We thank all our members who submitted all of the questions. I didn't even have to write any of them out. They, they were submitted by all of our members. And thank you all very much. Uh, please get out there and vote. <laughs>